Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Luke, chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. Listen for the word of God. Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Are you tired? I know. <laughs> I am too. It doesn't take much imagination to understand how tired Jesus and the disciples are in the text that was read this morning. They're exhausted. You know, they have been doing ministry for three years. Three years ago, they were fishing, minding their own business, making a living for their families when this charismatic religious leader came and said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And for three years, they have followed him around the Sea of Galilee, and they've watched, and they have experienced wonders. They watched him bring somebody back from the dead. They have watched him drive demons out of people and feed crowds of people. They've heard him speak in magnificent ways. And they have also watched him be beat up by the religious leaders and by people who did not understand what he was all about. I don't know how long it's been since you've read the gospel straight through, but I'm reading them right now. I'm in the middle of Luke, and I'm telling you, every time Jesus turns around, somebody is in his face saying, you did that wrong. You broke this rule. What are you doing? We don't understand. He can't get a break. He's tired. The disciples, they're, they're tired. And so, on this night, they gather together for the Passover. It's supposed to be a celebration. It's supposed to be fun. Passover meals are super fun. If you've never been to one, there's eating, there's the telling of a wonderful story, there's lots of wine to drink. And they have a wonderful night, right up until Jesus says, you know all this crazy stuff that's been happening since we came to Jerusalem? I know I've been on edge. I tipped the tables over in the temple. I've been snapping at you, I've been, I, you have to understand, they're about to break my body and shed my blood. And he was scared. He gave them the gift of the Last Supper, and, and I'm sure they were confused and they were exhausted and they've had too much to drink, and they just want to lay down now and be done with the day, be done with the week. And Jesus says, now I need you to come to a garden with me. I need to pray. Come with me. Can you imagine how tired they were when he said, after this whole week and this whole evening and three years of ministry, now I need you to come with me to a garden. I need you to stay awake and I need you to pray. They just wanted to lay down. Have you ever been so tired that you can't even put two thoughts together? 
I have, I know you have too. It's kind of like that thing when your alarm clock goes off and you know that voice that comes into your head when that happens, like your alarm goes off and you know you should get up, but then that voice says, oh no, it doesn't really take you 20 minutes to get ready. You can get ready in 10 minutes. So you hit the snooze button. You know that voice? I know they were hearing that voice. It was telling them, oh, he just needs to let you go to bed. He needs you to, he just needs to lighten up a little bit. You know, I, I remember when I heard that voice, that one that lies to you, uh, the most, um, the most vividly. I had gone to a Madonna concert. Do not judge me. I love Madonna, that material girl. I went to her concert. I had a front row seat. I got there early. She didn't start for two hours. And when I got out of that concert, I could not find my car. I was at this huge Pepsi stadium in Denver, Colorado, and I could not find my car. So I walked around the parking lot. I even called my friend to say, I think my car has been stolen. Should I call the police? I didn't know. Anyway, I walked around a parking lot in my cute high heels until I was exhausted and until every single car in that parking lot was gone, except for one. My car had not been stolen, it was the last car. It was like two o'clock in the morning and I had to drive all the way back to the Springs. So I got to my car, I started driving and that voice started talking to me. And that voice was saying, you know, just close one eye, the other eye will stay awake. Just close your eyes for like 10 seconds, you won't fall asleep. And that voice said, you know what? I, you're, you're not even sleepy. It's, it's just dry eyes. You've been at a concert all night. Go ahead, shut your eyes. And I thought, wow. So I called my son, Britton, who's a drummer, who happened to be up at two o'clock in the morning because he was gigging. And I said to him, Britton, what should I do? I, I just, I'm so tired. How do you do this all the time? How do you drive home at one in the morning and not fall asleep? And he said, mom, you know that voice that's talking to you? I knew exactly what he was talking about, that voice that kept saying, just shut one eye, it'll be fine, you're fine, keep driving. He said, do not listen to that voice, it is a liar. So now, every time my boys leave home or whatever we say, hey, drive carefully and do not listen to that voice, it is a liar. So, back to the garden. Jesus clearly says to the disciples, I'm gonna go over here and pray, and I need you to stay awake. And I need you to pray that you might not come into a time of trial or temptation. They hear his voice, but that other voice must be playing in their head, that one that lies. I can just hear that voice. It says to them, it's okay. You know, he's been on edge. Everything will be better in the morning. Sleep for a few minutes. It's okay. They have a choice to make in that garden. Which voice will they listen to? The one that says pray or the one that says go sleep? You know, the word for temptation or trial that Jesus uses, pray that you might not come into the time of trial, is a word in um, Greek and it means it's, it's, it's a word that means it's more than just a test. It's like a test, a deep test of what you believe a test of your faith. And Jesus' words are true. It's about to get dark. It's about to get real dark. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be tried in a mockery of a trial and he will be crucified. Now they may or may not know that that's coming but Jesus knows it and he says, pray that you will not be tempted. What I always find, um, Interesting, I, I always read this passage and it was like, I always thought Jesus was saying to them, pray for me, you know, help me, help me here, help strengthen me. When I read it this time, it's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, pray for yourselves that you will not come into a time of temptation or trial so that your faith will not be shaken. He's saying to them, you need to pray because the darkness is coming and you need to be ready. And then there's this most interesting play between the two scenes that are created. There's Jesus who goes off and prays. 
he does what he tells the disciples to do, pray so that you will be ready when the time of trial comes, when the darkness comes. He goes over and he prays. And that's contrasted with this group of people who sleep. Jesus prays. He is scared. I think in all of the Bible, besides on the cross, this is the most human that Jesus ever is. He's praying, he's crying. It says that he was so distraught that he sweats until his sweat looks like drops of blood falling off of him. He's distraught. And he says to God all of the things, let, let this cup pass from me. Why do I have to do this? I don't even understand what's going on. He is lost and he's alone and he is coming unglued in the garden. We saw signs of that when he tipped over the tables in the temple. This is a man who is frightened. He is losing it. And he trusts God enough with all of that emotion. And then he finds peace. It says that the angels come and minister to him and he emerges and you can see him change in the garden from a distressed man to the man that he is at the moment that, that Judas comes, kisses him on the cheek and betrays him. He enters the garden distressed and by the time Judas shows up with that kiss, he is a man who is focused and centered and ready to do this thing that God has asked him to do. He's gracious, he's compassionate, he's kind. That's the kind of transformation that happens through prayer when the darkness gets dark and when we are tempted. <laughs> Contrast that with the disciples. They've listened to the wrong voice. They heard Jesus say, pray, so that you will not come into the, so that you can pray, so that you might not come into the time of temptation. Pray, because it is going to get dark. And instead, they listen to the wrong voice, and they sleep. And when the time of temptation comes, Jesus, loving, compassionate, steady, strong, the disciples, confused. They don't know what day it is. They don't know where they're at. They stand up. They decide to be violent. Somebody takes a sword and cuts off the ear of someone. Jesus, calm, compassionate, puts that ear back on and heals that soldier. The disciples are completely confused. They scatter. Peter denies him three times. The rest of the disciples, they hole away in a, in a room. They lock themselves away. They're too frightened to even go to his trial, to even lend him support when he is dying on a cross. They are not ready. They are in a state of complete confusion until long after his resurrection. And I just have to wonder, I wonder what would have happened if they had listened to his voice instead of all those other voices that were in their heads telling them to sleep, telling them that we'd be okay. I wonder, would they have stood up with dignity and escorted him to his trial? Would they have ever resorted to violence? Would Peter have been strong enough to look those people in the eyes and say, yes, I followed him and I love him and I support him? Would they have hidden away or would they have been out on the streets telling people about this amazing and loving man that they have spent three years with? Would Jesus have died alone on a cross with his mother and John? Or would he have been surrounded by all of those people that he had poured his soul into for the past three years? We won't know because they didn't pray. And when we stop praying, when the darkness comes, we fall into utter confusion. We cannot be our best selves without prayer. We are in dark times. You know, it's not just COVID, although COVID has been absolutely exhausting. I think we're more tired than we ever imagined that we are. We won't really know how tired we are right now until we look back six months, a year from now and discover just how taxing this has been on us. It's not just COVID that's bringing this darkness. 
I mean, I'm not alone, right? You can feel it. We're in dark times. We're in angry times. And what do we do? We have to pray. It's not just COVID. It's all kinds of things. How many of you have lost a friend or a neighbor or even a family member during the past year? How many of you, because of politics, have stopped talking to somebody who disagrees with you and now this person that was your friend forever is no longer your friend or, or you are afraid to get together for a family meeting because everybody's angry at the table? Our church is facing a very difficult split and we have decisions to make. I, I just think that now is the time to center ourselves, to pray, so that when we have these conversations and when we interact with each other as a congregation and with our family members, that we can be our best selves. Prayer, it matters. And it is dark. And now is the time to pray. There are so many voices out there. I'll tell you what they're saying to you. They're saying things like, you don't need to stay awake or pray. You, 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 have, you don't have time to pray. You have work to do. You pray tomorrow. They're saying, you know what? Just zone out. Look at Instagram. Look at Facebook. That's much more. You'll feel better if you do that. Hey, you know what? Just watch more news. Just get really upset. Call your friend. Talk about it. Write a letter, post about it. If you don't like something, get angry. You'll feel better, let it out. And then those voices get really nasty. Things like, where is God in the midst of this darkness? Is there a God? And anyway, why do you think God cares about your prayers? You're not even holy. Do you think God cares about your petty day-to-day -day things? I am telling you, there are lots of voices out there. And they are liars. There is one true voice. And that is the voice of Christ. And he is saying to us, stay awake. Pray so that you will be ready for the time of trial and temptation. We have to discern. We have to recognize who the liars are, what voices are lying to us, and who is telling us the truth. It is time. There is one voice, and that voice loves you. And that voice wants to hear your prayers. And that voice will answer your prayers. And that voice is the only voice that can shatter the darkness and that can make you ready to face the darkness that we surely will face. Prayer, it matters. Hear now the words of Christ. Pray that you will not come into the time of temptation. Amen.